Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, online session of uh, Business Economics 2. I am your host Elias. Uh, we start this course with Unit 1, where we we'll simply look at uh, the macroeconomic environment and then uh, we will build this uh, throughout and determine the objectives as well as uh, the business activities. Let me take you through uh, the outline uh, of what we'll cover in this unit. So we are looking at the macroeconomic environment where we'll first start by looking at the macroeconomic objectives and these are the ones that we are going to present in this session. Then we will have uh, the secular flow of income in the next session as well as uh, determining the level of economic activities. And the last uh, session we will look at the business cycle. Now for further readings, you can uh, read essentials, Essential Economics for Business uh, by specifically looking at chapter 10 and economics for business uh, in chapter 16 and these two books were shared with you so please make sure you follow through these chapters and be uh, with me in this course okay so let's start with the macroeconomic environment key to note here is that for every business to be successful the business owners must look at several factors that affect business they should look at the, uh, the business environment in general. They should look at even the international market. How would other players respond? This means that they should not only look at uh, their own market or just look at their own decisions, but even other external factors that may affect the business. For example, if the economy is booming, that is, if there is an increased uh, output in a given economy, then individual businesses are likely to be more profitable than if the economy is in recession. Now, a recession is a, uh, a situation where the, there is deteriorating economic activities. And we see uh, high in, uh, unemployment levels with low inflation and so on. Businesses should also understand the forces that affect uh, the whole business climate. For example, one of these forces that we look at is the confidence of consumers as well as other businesses. Now, this is key because for every business to be successful, you will have to ensure that you understand how confident your consumers are with your product. Or, what is the confidence that your fellow competitors have over your product? If they look at your product, is it something that, can they, that they can easily override and then uh, become big businesses when you went in first? This should always be considered as a key fundamental force that can uh, uh, bring your business up or even destroy your business. Another key ingredient of the macroeconomic environment is government policy and the actions of the central bank. Now, when we, look at, we are looking at the government uh, uh, policies, we are looking at the effect of taxation and the government expenditure. And when we look at the forces of the central bank, we are looking at the interest rates as well as the money supply. Government raises tax. And if this happens, as an example, it, uh, this will impact directly on business profitability and on business confidence. If consumers ha are, are receiving lower disposable income, that is, the income after the removal of taxes, it means that their expenditure will be affected. Higher taxes means reduced expenditure on the side of a consumer and therefore this is gonna, going to distort the business environment. The macroeconomic environment also looks at the effect of domestic macroeconomic policies. 
It also includes the activities happening in the international macroeconomic market. This includes the international trade, the exchange rate market, and so on. All these affect the macroeconomic environment. Now, with the international uh, environment, which shows how countries and firms can gain from trade and why, despite this, we see that governments sometimes may choose to restrict trade for various reasons, and one of them being to protect the domestic uh, industries which may not be able to stand the international competition. It should also be noted that the business environment, uh, the macroeconomic environment also includes the flow of finances across international exchanges and the exchange rate determinations and how changes in exchange rates affect businesses. If, for example, you wanted to order goods from China and then you find that the exchange rate, assuming that you're buying your goods in dollars, your exchange rate has uh, gone up, meaning that kwacha has depreciated. It means then that you will have to pay more kwachas to get the given amount of dollars for you to be able to do your business. As such, it means then that imports have become expensive for you. And therefore, this has an impact on uh, the business environment because it is likely to reduce your volumes of imports. Finally, the macroeconomic environment also looks at attempts by governments worldwide to coordinate their macroeconomic policies. With this then, we can say that there are several macroeconomic variables that governments seek to control, and through and through, the macroeconomic environment will influence all aspects of businesses, including their markets, their costs, and their potential profitability. There are six main elements that uh, we use to influence the macroeconomic environment. These areas include the economic growth of a given nation, the levels of unemployment in a given nation, the inflation uh, rate, we also have the balance of a payment, the financial well-being of uh, the given nation as well as the financial stability. With the, uh, with the discussing of our macroeconomic objectives, we are going to look at these objectives in line with these six key areas which influence the macroeconomic environment. Let's start by looking at uh, the economic growth. Now, economic growth simply refers to the percentage increase in output over a 12-month period. That is, we are looking at the percentage increase in the output uh, on a, in a given uh, year. With this, governments aim to achieve economic growth over a long term. Now, it should be noted here that this growth uh, is supposed to be a stable kind of growth and not just growth high levels which are beyond, uh, uh, which cannot be controlled. So, they will aim for a stable rate of economic growth, which avoids both short-term rapid growth that cannot be sustained and periods of recession. So, if we are to look at economic growth, we need to have a long-term uh, growth that, that, will look, uh, that, that will bring the output of a given nation to continue increasing over a specified period of time. As opposed to seeing growth today and uh, a recession tomorrow, government's goal is to achieve a stable growth that is uh, sustained over a given period of time. The other variable that we'll look at is the unemployment. Now, with this, we can look at uh, uh, unemployment as being the situation where someone is looking for unemployment, looking for uh, a job, 
and that they qualify for that job, they are able to work, they are willing to work, but they just can't find that job. Then it means that such people are unemployed. In defining unemployment rate, this is the percentage of unemployed workers in the total labor force. Now, the labor force is a group or a population of people who are able to work, who are willing to work. Either they have a job or they do not have a job. So, labor force is equal to the unemployed plus the employed population. Workers are considered unemployed if they currently do not work despite the fact that they are willing and able to do so. Key to note is that they should be actively looking for a job. If someone is willing and able to work but they are not actively looking for a job, we cannot categorize them as being unemployed because they are not putting in effort to get that job. But if all the three key features, actively looking for employment, willingness and ability are all in one, then we can easily spot out an individual as either being unemployed or employed. The total labor force therefore consists of all employed and unemployed people within an economy. If we reduce the unemployment uh, in, in a given environment, then it means that then we will be heading to one key goal or objective of the government, which is to reduce unemployment to a given level. Now, by saying reducing unemployment, we're not saying bringing unemployment to zero. There will always be somebody who will be unemployed in a given economy because of our uh, economic situation. So, the key goal of the government then is simply to reduce the unemployment level to a given desired level. We also have another key uh, element of inflation. Now, this refers to a general rise in prices throughout the economy. If you go and uh, buy, say, a given product, boom, on the market, and you find that boom is uh, uh, the price of boom has gone up, then we cannot categorize that as inflation because the price has only been affected in one product. We define inflation if the change in the price levels is across different commodities. So therefore, it is simply the general rise in prices throughout the economy. The rate of inflation, therefore, is simply the percentage increase in the level of prices over a 12-month period. So we calculate within a given year how these prices have been rising over time. Government's policy, therefore, aims to keep inflation low and stable, as this will aid economic decision-making by creating a more certain economic environment. So if inflation, uh, if prices keep on uh, fluctuating, then there is likely to be uncertainty in the market or in the economy, and therefore this is likely to impact on the uh, business environment. Okay, so most uh, governments today have adopted an inflation rate target and to delegate responsibility to its central bank for interventions in money markets to affect interest rates. Now, this can easily be understood by looking at the Fisher's equation. So, if we follow through the Fisher's equation, which shows the relationship between interest rates and inflation rates, we will be able to understand how governments uh, expect uh, the central bank to influence interest rates through the inflation rate. So, real interest rates, therefore, is uh, approximately equal to the nominal interest rates minus the inflation. With this, if we see that uh, inflation is high, it means that the real interest rates will be low. 
If the nominal interest rate is high, holding inflation rate constant, then the real interest rate is likely, I mean, will be high. The opposite is true. If real interest rate is high, holding inflation rate constant, then it will tell you that therefore nominal interest rates are likely to be high. A low and stable rate of inflation in turn affect the business climate and confidence and can help to encourage investment. The question I'll ask you, which you will have to think about and then uh, get the solution is, why do you think this is the case? That if you have a low and stable inflation rate, which is likely to affect the business climate and confidence and therefore help encourage investment. Why should this be the case? Let me give you, uh, let me not call it a class task, but uh, uh, an example. If a loan has a 12% interest rate and the inflation rate is 8%, what is the real return on the loan? If a loan has a 12% interest rate and the inflation rate is 8%, what is the real return on the loan? Now, to answer this question, we use the Fisher's equation. So, let's denote real interest rate with capital R or real return, which will be equal to nominal interest rate, small i, minus inflation, which we are going to use uh, pi. So no, real interest rate is equal to nominal interest rate minus inflation. And if we do this, we have our nominal interest rate. So if a loan has a 12% interest rate, so this interest rate, which, is, uh, which you are physically seeing on a given loan, or which you are hearing on a given loan, is the nominal interest rate. So we will have the 12% here, 12% minus the inflation rate of 8%. So minus 8%. And if we do this, we will have our real return on a loan of 4%, according to the Fisher's equation. So this real return, then this is the return or the interest rate which is adjusted for inflation. So we have removed inflation out of the in, uh, interest rate and what we remain with therefore is the real interest rate. The other key objective is uh, the, uh, has to do with the balance of uh, payment. Now, the balance of payment is simply the record of the country's transactions with the rest of the world. So, remember, uh, I, I would want to urge you that all these features, key uh, elements that we are seeing here, we're going to look at them in more details and then describe what they are and why they are important for a given economy. Okay, so now, what we see from it that it shows the country's payments to or deposits in other countries which will be entered as debits because you are paying out therefore your national account will be debited and it also shows the receipts or the credits from other countries if you sell items to china and china pays you money that is recorded as a credit on your balance of payment it also shows the balance between these debits and credits under various headings such as the capital account, the financial accounts, and so on. Okay, so what we will note therefore is that government's aim uh, is to provide an environment in which exports can grow without an excessive growth in imports. So if we, we have more exports, than the imports, it means therefore that we are talking about a positive trade balance. And if this happens because we have exported, it means that our receipts will be, uh, will be high. That is, our inflow, cash inflow will be high because we have exported a lot. 
And we will see later on when we look at the secular flow of income that this export is an injection into an economy and the import will be a leakage. So the government would want to boost the injections so as to help improve uh, the economic stance. They also aim to keep the economy attractive to inward investment. So we will see all these components when we uh, turn our focus to the balance of payments. In other words, they seek to create a climate in which the country's earnings of foreign currency at least match or preferably exceed the uh, country's demand of foreign currency. If you are demanding more of foreign currency, it means therefore that you want to be making payments and therefore there will be high outflow. But if there is a high demand of foreigners for your currency, it means then you are having more inflows into your, uh, your economy. So still with the balance of payment, which should be noted therefore that the, uh, the government seek to achieve a favorable balance of payment. The sale of exports and other uh, receipts and foreign currency for a given country because you've exported the commodities and therefore the money that is coming in is uh, 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 foreign, uh, foreign currency and therefore it means that you're having more receipts uh, for your commodities. However, the purchase of uh, imports or any other payments abroad represents our demand for foreign currency. Because for us to be able to import, say from uh, USA or from China, we will need to exchange the quarter to the currency that is acceptable in the country where we are buying the commodities. Therefore, imports will imply that we need to demand for foreign currency for us to be able to buy the items. If we start to spend more foreign currency than we earn it, it means that one of the two uh, is likely to, to happen. In other words, if we have more imports than exports, then the balance of payment is likely to go into deficit or the exchange rate will have to fall. These are the two consequences of uh, having a, a trade deficit. So, we can therefore define the exchange rate as the rate at which one national currency exchanges for another currency. This, is a, uh, this rate therefore is expressed as the amount of one currency that is necessary to purchase one unit of another currency. In the case of uh, the quarter, for example, then we would say this uh, exchange rate is the amount of quarter that you need for you to be able to get one dollar. If you compare a quarter to a pound, then we are saying the exchange rate is the amount of quarter that you need to obtain one pound. For example, one United States dollar is uh, equal to 14,000, 14 quarter sequestering way, and this means that to buy one dollar, one would need 14 quarter sequestering way. This is the rate, so in other words, one dollar is equivalent to 14 quarter sequestering way. With this definition of exchange rate, an increase therefore in the amount of quarter, say from 14 to 18.4 uh, needed to get one dollar, would mean therefore that quarter has lost value and therefore quarter is said to have depreciated. Remember, this is speaking from the definition that we are looking at the amount of a currency needed to obtain a unit of another currency. So if this uh, amount of quarter increases, it means that therefore the exchange rate has increased and therefore the quarter has depreciated. You, need, you now need more quarter to get the same dollar that you got, uh, say, yesterday at 14.6 uh, quarter. But now it is 18, meaning your quarter has lost value in relation to a dollar. And with this, the quarter is said to have depreciated. The opposite is true. If the quarter was, if a dollar was trading at 18.4 quarter 
and now you can buy it at 14.6 quarter it means therefore that quarter has gained more value against the united states dollar and therefore quarter will say will be said uh, to have appreciate will be said to appreciate let's look at the financial well-being in the macroeconomic environment the behavior of individuals businesses governments and nations is affected by their financial well-being for example if consumers and firms are worried about their financial well-being they are likely to become more conscious they will they will be more conscious of what they eat what they buy where they take their money who should get what item at home or whether to invest in a given business or not so their financial well-being will stand as a pillar to their decisions in, uh, on how their finances will be used. If governments are concerned about government debt, they are likely to try to reduce spending or increase taxation. Or they may do both uh, reducing expenditure and increasing taxation. So if they reduce expenditure, it means they are reducing the level of economic activities. If they increase taxation, they are again reducing the level of output for a given nation. There, because of this, you will see that a higher taxation, as earlier alluded, will, inf uh, will negatively influence consumers and as such, they will spend less because their disposable income will be low. We also have the financial stability. And now, a core aim of the government and the central bank is to ensure the stability of the financial system. You should note that the well-being of the financial system is critical to the well-being of the economy. If the financial system is not well taken care of, there are a number of consequences that may uh, come out which may be tedious for the government and the central bank to handle if not carefully aligned to their policies. Because of the global interconnectedness of financial institutions and markets, problems can spread globally like a contagion. Take the case of the 2008 global financial crisis which started uh, in uh, the US in, in one country, but spread uh, across the... Uh, take the case of the 2008 global financial crisis, which started in one country, but the impact was felt across the globe. Financial institutions then should have more loss-absorbing capacity and therefore be better able to withstand shocks and deteriorating macroeconomic conditions. With this brief background then, we can highlight the key six uh, government objectives that uh, are key for the uh, stable economy. So government therefore have the following policy objectives, which is to ensure high and stable economic growth. Secondly, the government has an objective of ensuring low unemployment, low and stable inflation, ensure the avoidance of balance of payment deficits and excessive exchange rate fluctuations, ensure the avoidance of uh, excessively financially distressed sectors, of the economy which also includes the government and finally a stable financial system so these are the key six uh, macroeconomic objectives uh, that are pursued by different governments okay so thank you very much for watching if you have questions please send an email to muawelias at gmail.com or you can phone uh, 0966-720487 Better still, you will find this video and many others on uh, 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 the YouTube channel, Elias Muau. Make sure you like the channel and subscribe to the channel for you to be able to get uh, automated updates whenever there is anything new posted on the channel. See you in the next unit.